All right, let's do Why Wassum first. I'm going to turn off uh, the music, um, the, the, slow, the low music, and we'll talk about why, wa why Wassum, why people want Wassum. I'll clip this for YouTube. Um, so I'll, 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 we'll, we'll record it. We'll put it on YouTube. Um, now, for those of you who haven't been around for very long, um, we are in the process of building a cloud. And part of this goes into uh, that, um, why you might. So there's a lot of reasons. Let me start with an intro. I'm not very good at this live recording of a video. Um, well, well, for those of you who aren't, we are building a cloud. Um, it's stalled a little because, uh, well, we can get into why it's stalled a little bit, but, um, and some of, one of the big reasons we're doing it is to learn. How do you run untrusted code? How do you safely provide people access to hardware? How do you do these things? And, and so one of the things like we like to do or say is to learn something new. And so that's the goal of my stream is to help us learn something new, whether it's from my failures, me trying stuff. That's why we're trying HTMX. I, I've never used HTMX, but we're going to try it. We're going to learn something new, whether we like it or we hate it or something in between. It doesn't matter. If we learn something new through it, then we're doing great. Um, so that being said, one of the reasons we're building the null cloud is to learn something new. Let's talk about Wassum. Welcome. If you're watching this on YouTube, we stream this live on Twitch. Go ahead and join. You get to ask questions and interact, and it's awesome. But I've been asked, why, why Wassum? Now, there's a lot of reasons to run Wassum. Uh, there's reasons in the browser where you can use other languages than JavaScript and run your code safely in a browser, leveraging the Wassum runtime. And But those are not what I'm talking about today. Today, I'm going to talk about why Wassum on the back end. What I, what I mean by this is on your back end servers, back end servers, not browsers. Okay, so I'm not covering about why you might want to run it on your browsers. I'm also not talking, not talking about apps. So another application where you might use this was let's say you wanted to run a Windows, Mac, Linux application. Now, a lot of people would write like an Electron app, but let's say that you like writing in Rust or Go or some other language than JavaScript or TypeScript, which is effectively JavaScript. Now, if that's you, then you might like this for platform portability, um, but we're not talking about uh, platform portability either. These are, these are actually really strong cases for it. And one other really strong case for it that, uh, I, I, I like would be plugins. Not, not that, not that. Plugins. So, uh, another really strong case for Wasm or something like that is the ability to let other people write code to extend your code or, or basic plugin architectures. And another thing for all of you that are new and for YouTube, all of these notes that I take here are actually stored in Git in Markdown files, so you can go and check them out. Um, once the video is done and up, it will be in done and you can go find them here. Um, so you can go ahead and find the video that goes with the notes that we take. Um, which is pretty cool. These are good arguments for Wasm, but not what I'm talking about today. Um, I think these are actually really self-explanatory. Um, but if people are struggling with why these would be self-explanatory, that's fine. Um, go ahead and ask and we'll make, we'll cover why Wasm would work really well. What we're going to talk about today is backend servers. Um, so where your code generally runs, you know, in Kubernetes, it's running in a container. Otherwise, you're talking about a Linux process, uh, generally on Linux. So that's what we're talking about. And why would you want to run Wasm? I, I've called Wasm uh, the next JVM. 
uh, the J JVM is Java Virtual Machine. Or sometimes I say yet another JVM, uh, yet another JVM. But uh, that's that's mostly me uh, dunking on it. But anyways, so why would you want to put Wasm on your backend servers? Most likely you're writing Go or Rust or something like this that compiles to the Linux platform that you want anyways. So the portability, in my opinion, isn't a big deal. Although some have said, you know, for ARM, it's it's harder to write Go. Um, for me, the portability isn't really there. I'm targeting Linux. I'm targeting a well-known architecture. I don't really need it to be portable. And this is where the null cloud comes in. And, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to do a stream on this on Monday. Since Monday I have off, I'm going to do a Monday stream, kind of like a Saturday stream. Um, and we're going to explore this concept. So the null cloud right now provides safe running, safe execution via something called gvisor gvisor uh this is a basically implements the kernel calls and it does virtual memory basically it, it does virtual memory uh we'll just do vmem uh memory uh so it does some virtual memory for each container and this helps further isolate your container to allow you to run untrusted code untrusted code because Part of the goal of the null cloud is to be able to let you run code on it. And to do that, I have to make sure that your code, I'm going to call uh, Dane Alex out. I'm going to, I have to make sure that Dane Alex's code doesn't mess with Countron's code, some other untrusted code. I have to make sure that these two play nicely together. Nothing that Dane does should be able to interfere with something another user does. And even furthermore, and maybe even more terrifying, this is my hardware. Maybe it has keys on it. Maybe it has, uh, you know, SSH certs or something sitting on it. I also have to protect uh, my box from Dane. I'm picking on Dane because he's been here for a while. And he understands that I'm just using it as a reference. Um, so this is one of the things that when you're running as a cloud, you have to do. So we obviously, with GVisor and all of this, these are actually containers. Um, so let's let's actually add that layer in here. These are containers. Containers. Uh, okay, so let's do this. And all of these are just methods. I don't know why that sometimes does that. All right. These are just methods to sandbox. These are just sandboxing methods. There's a couple things here. Virtualizing memory is expensive. So this is expensive. Um, this is expensive. Containers themselves have some overhead, uh, have some overhead, some overhead. Um, and this whole stack is pretty complicated. The whole stack is kind of complicated. Um, from running GVisor to virtualized memory to containers with some container runtime that we didn't even put in here, some container runtime, and then getting the untrusted code on there. Now, this is how the null cloud currently works. How we currently run untrusted code is this method right here, and it's it's kind of complicated. The other thing that people like to do is this thing called uh, functions, or, you know, if you're in AWS, this is like Lambda. So Lambda functions, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it serverless. That makes me hurt inside. And so I don't call it serverless. Uh, but these things, and what happens with these, what happens with these is this untrusted code isn't work running until you get some event. And that's where this, this, this diagram right here comes into play. Um, that I made for you all. What happens is this code isn't just sitting there and running. Now, in the null cloud as it exists today, that's exactly what's happening. Your code runs whether you're using it or not. And people want to be like, well, if I'm not using it, can it just not run? And that's where the, the you know, the Lambda functions come in. Well, so right now in the null cloud, if we were to do this, when that when that request comes in, that event comes in, 
we would have to spin up new virtual memory, a new container with your tr untrusted code in it. And this can take five to 10 seconds. That's okay for a lot of people. To be honest, that's acceptable for a lot of people that want it to run once or twice a day. But it is kind of a bad user experience. For whatever end user is making this HTTP request, a lot of the times the events are HTTP. That's a, the, the one user you have a day gets a bad experience. So can we make this better? And that's where, that's where hopefully, oh, let's see, is that all fitting in the screen? Hopefully, Wasm steps in. Wasm provides a sandbox. Wasm provides a sandbox. And so uh, the color coding is here is this is customer one, this is customer two, this is customer three, customer four. And this is all of their untrusted code. We'd like to spread their untrusted code out. These are everything that's white is my infrastructure, the null clouds infrastructure. And we'd like to, and this is basically available, available space, available space. Wouldn't it be easier if the only thing we had to do was run Wasm, have a Wasm runtime. Forget all of this complexity and just provide a Wasm runtime like this. The other thing here is a Wasm, if it can protect memory sufficiently, that's still up for debate. If it can protect memory sufficiently, that this will be fast, very fast, because it doesn't have to spin all of these things up. Uh, the claims are that this will take a millisecond or, or uh, 10 milliseconds maybe to spin up this untrusted code. So we could get a new request by customer five, customer five. Their code will have had already been compiled. Let's make them a fun new color. They're, they're going to get this aqua-ish color here. Yep. Customer five is. And customer five is going to make the request here. Well, we should be able to run customer five here almost instantly. That's not the same color. There we go. Almost instant or within 10 milliseconds. That's the idea. And that's why people are excited about Wasm on the back end for other reasons than these. I mean, some people are excited for the platform uh, portability, the plugins, and whatnot, but. What we really need for serverless, I'm going to put serverless in quotes because I, yeah, uh, for serverless is isolation and small overhead. Thank you. If you're watching this on YouTube, want to join in, ask questions why, <laughs> while we're having this. Go ahead, hit that like and follow button. But go ahead and join us on Twitch at Merrick Counts. And uh, yeah, if you're here on Twitch, let's let's continue on. We have a we have Kubernetes to get into. Does this all make sense? Any questions? So at this point, I think Monday, for all of you who are here, we're gonna try to shoehorn Wasm into the null cloud. It's probably going to fail and it's probably going to be not great, but it's going to be a learning experience for all of us. It's going to be a learning experience for all of us. When that video is done, I'll put it in the done category. Um, and you guys can get this on the, if you do get, I believe Git is the command. No, it's not. It's a GitHub. GitHub. You can see the GitHub. That's the null channel. The, the notes are there. I haven't pushed these yet. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do is in the notes. So you'll see like this debunking common myths. If it's related to an article, you can find the article that we're working with there um, with what I will try to start doing. I haven't been doing this, but what I will try to do is come back and put in the video. So if you're wanting to watch the video, 
I don't take super detailed notes here. Um, but I feel like it would be good to, with the video if you're wanting to uh, open them up and look at some of the stuff. Uh, some of them I take kind of detailed notes. Yeah, the, the gist of why I'm interested in, in Wassum and have been watching it. Like I said, there's a lot of reasons you could be interested. I, I think if we're talking about what's holding Wassum back in some of these, like this platform portability, what Wassum really needs for this is a really good front end framework because I think Wassum could be a really awesome like cross platform app development kit. Um, and I think the reason it's not is there's just not a good UI library. Like good UI libraries are far and few between anyhow, but there's just not a big mainstream one that a company's maintaining and keeping up, um, which I, I think hurts it in the end.